joining us for this um, wonderful session on China as a global security challenge, the view from the Western Hemisphere. I, um, I first want to thank the McCain family. I'm Jennifer Griffin. I'm the chief national security correspondent for Fox News at the Pentagon. I've been at the Pentagon for 15 years, and I've known the McCain family for a long time. I actually played field hockey in high school with Sydney McCain when she was at St. Agnes School for Girls in Alexandria, Virginia. And she was as fierce on the hockey field as her father was fierce in Congress and elsewhere. And then, of course, I'm married to Greg Myrie, who, um, who hosted an earlier panel. And we often compete for stories because we're on the same beat. He works for NPR, and I'm with Fox. And of course, he stole the story of us being at the Hanoi Hilton with uh, Senator McCain uh, on the 25th anniversary of the, of the uh, fall of Saigon. And, and it was that picture where somebody had, was giving the bird to um, the Vietnamese captors. And, and it was Senator McCain who pointed that out to us. So I'm joined today by an incredible panel of mavericks. I will call you all mavericks. Senator John Cornyn, of course, of the great state of Texas on the Senate Select Intelligence Committee and has just returned from a CODEL uh, visit to Panama, Colombia, Argentina, and Brazil. So we'll want to hear about that. And we also have General Laura Richardson, four-star general, who's head of US Southern Command, SOUTHCOM, if you will, um, in the ac Pentagon acronym system. You, are, you have 31 nations under your area of responsibility, General Richardson, and 21 of them have signed up for China's Belt and Road Initiative. So that's quite stunning. And who ever thought when you took over SOUTHCOM that you would be actually dealing with China? And then we have, of course, our good friend, Ambassador Juan Carlos Pinzon, who two times uh, ambassador to Washington, DC, from Colombia, and also the former defense minister of Colombia. And we're so glad to have you here with us today. Thank you. I want to start with a quick lightning round. If you have a, a great John McCain story, please share it. But also a lightning round about what are we not paying attention to in Latin America, Central America, uh, in terms of China moving in, what have you seen that should alarm any American who's listening right now? Well, this is a PG crowd, so I won't give you a McCain story. Uh, <laughs> but I will say uh, Deng Xiaoping said, hide your motives and bide your time. And what we've seen in, um, in uh, Southcom, in General Richardson's area of responsibility, is that uh, in action where um, the Chinese are relentless and opportunistic. So in terms of, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, being, uh, for my invitation here to the McCain Institute. And when I was the uh, Senate liaison for the Army to the United States Senate as a colonel, um, I got to, uh, was able to take uh, Senator McCain a couple of times on uh, a couple of uh, short trips to Walter Reed and uh, things like that, but certainly my privilege to be here. But in terms of uh, what's happening on our region, I call it a call to action. And, um, and we have, uh, I, I say this region is our neighborhood, uh, but I'd like to say that it's on the 20-yard line that the uh, PRC encroachment uh, is in the red zone. And there's a reason why I say the red zone, because of the, uh, all of the critical infrastructure, what looks to be like investment is extraction. And if we don't bring all of the instruments of national power together from the United States, from Team USA, and brand it, um, uh, we're going to wake up uh, to some very, um, very um, things that are, uh, we don't want to happen. And uh, again, I say that it's a call to action, and we need to act now. Ambassador Pinzon. Well, Jennifer, thank you. First of all, thanks to the McCain Institute. I really want to recognize uh, you know, all the team, and they have done a wonderful conference, so I'm honored to be here and definitely to Arizona State University that is part of all this. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting several times uh, uh, Senator McCain, and I can see him as one of the fathers of Plan Colombia, as you are, Senator Cornyn, and many of the members of Congress that we have seen here. So there are many reasons from my side and from my country and nationals to be thankful to him and to all of you. But. Uh, a very specific one, you know, that he was brief of the most famous operation we did in Colombia the day before we executed that operation. When we rescued the hostages, including three Americans, he was in Cartagena. 
and we were able to brief him on that operation. And we always will have that in mind, so I will even say that later on my time as Minister of Defense, he really mentored me in Washington, as good friends as Senator Corning did, did for me and for the good of these relationships. China and the region. I will go a st step back. Sorry for what I'm going to say, but you know I'm not anymore an active duty ambassador, so I'm free to say some things. Mm. I see the problem as I see this room now. The level of interest of what is happening in the Western Hemisphere is not the level that is required. The situation in the region is more complicated than you think. And by the way, these extra-regional powers are showing up. And are showing up at a time in which probably the United States, because of the natural challenges I see, domestic, in the Pacific, certainly in Central Europe, are you know, putting a lot of energy out there, but we're missing looking south. And others are starting to be very opportunistic, as you said, sir, and they are getting a very good space. Maybe we can argue a little bit more about this, but that's what I see now. General Richardson, how is China moving in? You've recently been down to the Magellan Straits, to the Drake Passage. Why are you going to those places? Give us some examples of how China's moving in. Right, so Belt and Road Initiative, so I say the, uh, as you brought up, the uh, 21 of 31 countries have signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative, so it looks like the, uh, how China's way of getting into the region, getting into the countries under the guise or disguise, again, of investment, what looks to be investment. Uh, and, but when you talk about 21 of 31 countries, all of these projects are in the billions of dollars, B, not M. And when you're talking about in all of the critical infrastructure, whether it's telecommunications, 17 countries, 29 deep water port projects, uh, space enabling infrastructure. Why is there the most space enabling infrastructure in this region out of any other place in the globe? Five countries, 11 uh, PRC facilities, space facilities. Again, the telecommunications, the deep water ports. And so, um, let me just ask you about the space, because space is interesting. Maybe they just like to look at the stars. Yeah. What are they doing? You were down in Argentina. What are they actually doing? All right, so you have uh, three uh, deep space stations that China has. Two are in mainland China, and one is in Argentina. A 50-year lease that Argentina gave to the, the Chinese. Uh, and uh, they don't have access to it. They have to ask to come to the facility. And, uh, and so certainly we were very concerned about the third deep space, station, uh, deep space station being in Argentina and being in the Western Hemisphere. This is a hemisphere that is, again, it's our hemisphere. And we have all of this, uh, uh, all of this critical infrastructure investment with billions of dollars of projects. If you add up the last five years of investments, over 50 billion investment of the PRC into the region. And we're not the, this isn't the first hemisphere they've done that. I mean, they've obviously done that in Africa, they've done that in Europe. And so, but this is just happening, uh, as the ambassador said, um, under the nose, it just quietly, people aren't recognizing it as we look east-west, and I call it south blindness. Uh, but again, it's right on our homeland uh, and it's in our red zone. And isn't it that the, with regards to space, that the concern is that they will try to blind US satellites. Um, they're going to be exploring the moon. What, what, what is it that uh, maybe your average American isn't thinking about in terms of um, how the next war might be in space? Right, so the, uh, as we think about cyber, cyber is at the top of all of uh, our uh, countries in the region's list lots of cyber attacks and things like that, but people aren't necessarily thinking about cyberspace, right? And the tracking, the telemetry and tracking of their own satellites, but the ability to do the uh, space object surveillance of our satellites from the US and our partners and allies satellites as well. Senator Cornyn, you were just on this incredible CODEL visit. What did you see in Panama? We're hearing about China buying up areas around the Panama Canal, why does that have you concerned? Well, I've never been to the Panama Canal before, so that was sort of a, one of the wonders of the world that got a chance to see, but um, 
to the general's point, uh, China's been moving in, making investments, um, debt, um, um, using the, the debt that, people, that countries incur in order to make investments there. And of course, many of these countries are hungry to have these infrastructure investments, but they always come with strings attached. But one of the lessons I got from uh, talking to the president of Panama is we have, uh, we're not taking advantage of some of our natural opportunities. For example, the president of Panama graduated from the University of Texas, and uh, he wanted to talk about NCAA basketball and, and, and uh, cattle ranching, and just sort of having sort of those natural connections using the soft power uh, that our country has, the advantages we have. We've been focused on other parts of the world, and we all understand that, but we, can, we neglect, uh, we neglect uh, Southcom and, and uh, Mexico South at our peril uh, because um, China is not a benign influence. Uh, they're going to continue to take, see opportunities and fill the vacuum, and uh, I think to our detriment. Well, also, the Senate has not approved um, quite a few ambassadors who are supposed to be in position. So how can we use soft diplomacy if we don't have ambassadors? Well, we don't have an ambassador in Colombia right now, for instance. That's a self-inflicted error on the <laughs> part of the so. United States Senate. Um, obviously, that reflects the priorities of the majority leader. But one of the things I'm going to go back and uh, after talking to, to, to General Richardson, some of these vacancies, key vacancies, we need to get filled. And we need to get them filled quickly because we need to maintain that uh, those relationships uh, much better than we have been. Yeah. Ambassador, talk to us about the view from Colombia. What is China doing in your country? What do you see in the region? How is China moving in? What, what, what should we be focusing on? Let me build a little bit of what is happening in Latin America first, because that's something that I believe is very important to understand. After COVID, the region was really hardly hit. And it has created a major impact, both in the economic side, so it exposed poverty, inequality, and unfortunately, corruption. According to Gallup poll, 74% of Latin Americans believe that governments are corrupt. So you know the, the, the credibility of institutions is very low. On the other side, uh, we have seen these pre-Cold uh, War movements taking advantage of this and creating this populist narrative that is being effective in every country of the region, allowing this to take place. What worries me? I see in many cases uh, attitudes pro-autocracy. That's the kind of situation we're seeing in several countries. Several things that are going against the institutions and against democracy as we know it. And this is where you know, the extra regional powers fit. Because what they're saying is, there's a vacuum here. If there's no prosperity in this part of the world, it's ideal for them to offer infrastructure financing or technology, as the General Richardson described, and very much mining, natural resources, which are not being necessarily exploited for the benefit of our countries, but probably to be used in this global power competition on different uh, layers of that competition. That's what is happening. Something that worries me is that populists very easily move into the idea of you know, explaining that democracy is not working well, and because it's not working well, we need to find models that work. And suddenly we have these autocracy or autocratic regimes from different parts showing how effective they are as opposed to how Western democracies are not. And that is what I believe is becoming person. I will even add a line. You know, the Monroe Doctrine, as criticized as it can be, you know, some people can speak great about it, some others doesn't. My opinion is that it's a realistic relationship in the hemisphere between the US and the region. But I will argue that today, 200 years after, we are at a point in which the US has the lowest level of influence in the region as compared to the, two, to the past 200 years. And it, I know it's a strong argument, uh, but I think it's something that needs to be built on. So that's why I, I, I really support very much what General Richardson is saying. All other elements need to be included. And what Senator Corning just said, 
The power of the United States is not only its military power, it's the power to create prosperity. It's the power of innovation and technology. It's the power of having the best schools in the planet. And it's the power of freedom and economic prosperity. That's what Latin America needs from the US, really connecting onto that. If I can just add to what the ambassador said, the, in terms of our soft power, is, is uh, the military to military relationships that the United States has with uh, countries like Colombia over the last 20 years with one of the most successful partnerships in the counter-drug mission and counter-terrorism mission with Plan Colombia. Yes. Uh, we saw in not only Colombia, but even in Brazil, where many of the top uh, military leaders have been trained in some of our war colleges and the like. Uh, they can provide a, a stabilizing influence and a line of communication with these countries when perhaps the political leadership uh, tends to go in another direction and creates a more instability. So I think the soft power we have by the military to military relationships uh, in welcoming more students from that region into our colleges and universities is an important part of the answer. And General Richardson, what are you seeing in terms of either um, countries being willing to send their colonels to come to the Army War College and to the US? Are we still inviting them? Are they still willing to come? And are you doing exercises with these other uh, militaries? And how concerned are you about what's happening in Colombia? Because Plan Colombia is in jeopardy right now, it seems well, to me. Well, so the, uh, uh, our, all of the, our partner nations want to come and uh, go to our, our schools in the United States. Our International Military Education Program, Professional Military Education Program, is by far the best. But the Chinese are using our playbook against us. And they have one, two, and four year education programs, all expense paid in Beijing. And so we have competition. We used to not have a competition in the region. Though our partners want to partner with us. Ambassador Pinzone said it. Those economies in these countries are hurting. They are hurting bad from COVID. And we see the residual impacts that are happening from, uh, from COVID in our own country. And so they're looking for investment. That's why the BRI is so uh, attractive to them. And it's not by, it's by a choice. It's, it's by a necessity that they're having to sign up. They would prefer not to because they know the strings are attached, but they have to. Uh, they have to show progress for the people. The other thing is, is that these administrations are in the seat for one term, generally, across the board, four years. They're working on a stopwatch, not a calendar. And so they have to deliver in months, not years. And some of our processes take a long time to deliver. So they're looking for what can, they can get cranes and show progress and things like that for the people. Um, and I think that's why this uh, autocracy versus democracy is resonating because they say they're gonna fix the problems. But then these, you know, they use this uh, democracy to get into the seat in these administrations and then they can't deliver for their people either. But I have a solution. We have a solution with Team USA because we have a very powerful interagency. We have it. Uh, the Chinese state-owned enterprises controlled by the government, that's why they're able to wield all this, in, these instruments of national power all together because they all work for the government, a communist government, by the way. Uh, if we can get our interagency, I talked to, uh, in terms of discussions, recent discussions with Secretary Blinken and Secretary Raimondo, about Team USA branding. We need, there's investment going on in the region, but the leaders aren't seeing it. The leaders of these countries aren't seeing Team USA. When these tenders are coming out for the contracts for critical infrastructure, why are there only Chinese companies that are ending up on the sheet for uh, the competition? Why are Western investment not on, the, not on the list? There's a disconnect here. And we need to bring all of our instruments of national power, our interagency, and then we need to speak with one voice. We can be very powerful, but we can be weak too if we're not speaking with the same voice. And we need to show investment in the region. Ambassador Pinzon, are you seeing some buyer's remorse from some of the Latin American countries that have bought into the Belt and Road Initiative, that they aren't happy with the Chinese investment? Or is, there, is, there any, is the pendulum swinging back at all? Not yet. I think we're not in the, in the time where Africa or Southeast Asia is, where they're already seeing the consequences. We're in the middle of you know, getting as many projects as they can. So you go the map, and every country in the region is getting a major infrastructure set of projects. Also, every mining country, lithium, gold, or any other kind of major mineral, is getting a, a you know, Chinese 
uh, investment. And right now, the region sees this as an opportunity. We're selling to China, we're connecting to it, and as I said, since there are populist regimes, most of them coming from parties that were born to be anti-American in the uh, era of the Cold War, and now, of course, they face with a different thing, they're really you know, seeing this as an interesting uh, event. I'll give, you, I'll give you something that I believe is important just to watch. Look what President Lula has been doing. He comes to Washington and then comes, comes to China and offers you know, everything. The former president of Brazil, President Rousseff, is currently the president of the new, quote unquote, development bank. That's how they call the Bank of the BRICS. So what is their intention here? Expanding that influence through financing, through you know, solving problems as you know, Richard Sung has well explained, the region is eager for prosperity. Now, there's another element that I believe is very important and I think is a major challenge. And in a way, you see it in your borders. And it's part of this immigration debate. We've seen more and more Latin America, you know, will, what describe the grudges of organized crime. From Mexico to Argentina, you see structures of you know, cartels, cocaine, uh, fentanyl, but you see also human trafficking, but you see legal mining of uh, gold and other minerals, or you see street organizations that are just selling uh, narcotics to even communities in Latin America, not only in the US. That is deteriorating the security of the region. Today, the top 10 cities of the world that are more violent are located in Latin America. And yes, it's not a part of a war. It's not a part of a major uh, you know, crisis. It's just the ongoing situation. But that deterioration in the economy, the quality of life, and of course security, makes a lot of people to think, what do we do? So we leave. And that's where you get part of the problem. So making Latin America prosperous makes a lot of sense for the US. And by the way, if you think on the positive agenda, and you see from Canada to Argentina, we're a billion people. And this part of the world has water, natural resources, biodiversity, young population, same culture. Let's not forget, the fourth largest speaking Hispanic country in the world is the United States of America. You know, don't forget about it. You better learn Spanish, as we should learn English. You know, that's what we need to do for the good of us. That's how we can create the ties and the bridges that can really create this prosperity. I think Latin America, of course, has benefit of being close to the US, but that's history now. We need to look to the future, and the future is how do we take advantage of being this nation the most advanced in the world, and us being a very uh, potential region of opportunity and, and growth. And that's what we need to connect. So I, I think I'm, I'm speaking a little bit for what General uh, uh, Richardson sees every day. You know, uh, she's traveling more than anyone I've seen. You know, you, you've been in every part of the of, of the region. I think that's very important now. Jennifer, there's another dynamic in, in terms of the PRC strategy with regard to uh, South America, Central and South America, and really Africa and around the world. And you know, we woke up after COVID and realized our vulnerability of our supply chains things like advanced semiconductors from Asia, which could be disrupted with another pandemic, a natural disaster, or heaven forbid, a military invasion of, of Taiwan. Um, but we're dependent on uh, China for processing some of the critical minerals that go into most of our high-tech products, where everybody's paying a lot more attention to electric vehicles, but 70% plus of the electric batteries in the world are made in China because they have almost got a monopoly. And many of the countries in South America, Africa and around the world provide the raw materials, they'll mine it, but then ship it to China to do the processing because some of it is frankly uh, environmentally challenging uh, and because of the permitting problems we have here in the United States and the concerns we have about uh, the environment. But that's another big vulnerability for the United States, and they are exploiting uh, these natural resources in, in the Western Hemisphere and around the world. 
and making us more and more dependent on them, which is exactly where they want us to be. Well, they're gobbling up the natural resources and the supply chain, and that's where the lithium triangle comes in, mm -hmm. which General Richardson, weren't you just in the, the, explain the lithium triangle and why it's so important and how right. China's moved in. So 60% of the world's lithium in Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. And so we've already learned the lesson when one country has the monopoly on, uh, on, a, on a critical product, uh, PPE, we already learned that lesson. Um, but you know, the, uh, in terms of 75% of China's lithium comes from the lithium triangle. And so a geostrategic competitor uh, having the monopoly and having a, a disproportionate access and influence to a critical uh, element for uh, electric vehicles, for uh, you know, our transition to clean energy. Um, but it, it's rich. This whole region is rich in rare earth elements, critical. I mean, it's gold, copper, uh, light sweet crude that was discovered off Guyana. Guyana is the fastest growing economy in the world. And over the next five years, 25% increase in its GDP. Over the next five years, it's huge. And we gotta be looking at that because that country can be a, a stabilizing factor in the region, in the Western Hemisphere uh, with that. But what are we doing to invest in there and make sure that that they aren't taken advantage of, right, with this new discovery. Well, isn't it Guyana and also Honduras, who recently, because of pressure from China as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, have just uh, renounced their ties to Taiwan? Right. Is that correct? And, and explain what's happening in terms of that. What are you seeing across the region in terms of turning the countries, because of the Belt and Road Initiative, turning their back on Taiwan? Well, in Argentina, for example, when we were there, Argentina, by the way, has a 100% inflation rate. Uh, their track record of paying back their debts, they can't get assistance mm -hmm. from the International Monetary Fund and other sources. So when China comes along offering free stuff, um, they can't, as General Richardson said, it's hard for them to say, well, you know, we don't like the strings or the terms of this agreement. But we're also seeing that in places like Panama as well. Uh, where the president and others are very, are, are being very um, uh, careful to make sure that China keeps its promises because so often they do not. They'll bring in Chinese workers, they won't meet uh, the deadlines in, in terms of, of, of the agreement. But uh, that's what I meant when I said that they are relentless and opportunistic. They'll look for any crack in our armor and uh, take full advantage of it. So I think, um, uh, as the senator is talking about, I think what we need to do in terms of with the uh, increase of investment and uh, a Team USA branding and coming in with, uh, we need to be advertising Team USA. We need to put the country's flag from the country that we're working with as well as the United States flag. And when you, they don't see the investment that's happening. I talked to the Atlantic Council, the, the, uh, the Council of the Americas. Our large companies are investing billions in this region and the leaders are not seeing it. We're not advertising it. We're not bringing to bear all of our instruments of national power and showing it. And we need to do that because they think we're ignoring us. Um, they, the region, thinks we're ignoring. We, the US, is ignoring them and we're not. But I think also we need to keep a rap sheet on these Chinese companies. Uh, the labor disputes, the bribery that they're doing of senior officials, mayors, uh, ministers, uh, cost overruns, the shoddy projects that are happening when these projects are done so bad and then they cause other problems for the country. And we need to advertise that rap sheet as the evidence of what is actually happening with these companies in the region. So are you saying that US companies are investing there, we're just not talking enough about it? Or is there also a case where US companies, it's too difficult to operate, there's something holding them back from going there? What's happening? Well, I think, uh, although it's not in the general's AOR, uh, was in, I was in Mexico with 12 of my colleagues from the House and the Senate, bicameral, bipartisan meeting with President Lopez Obrador. And part of our message to him was, you know, this is a historic opportunity, particularly for in North America for a country where we've enjoyed this uh, treaty relationship because of NAFTA, now the USMCA, and the reshoring or offshoring uh, from China. Uh, this is a great opportunity for Mexico. Unfortunately, uh, because of the political leadership and some of the ideology, they, you know, they just built a big airport outside of Mexico City by the army building it because President Lopez Obrador doesn't, he, he's so concerned about 
corruption. He trusts the Army and the Navy, and now he's put the Army and the Navy in charge of all their uh, land and seaports doing customs work. Mm. And so it's a very different uh, approach, economic approach, um, and unfortunately, we've got to figure out how to work with them. As I told President Lopez Obrador, I took a little bit of a chance, and I said, Mr. President, uh, the United States and Mexico are like an old married couple. <laughs> we, uh, we, have to, we have to make the marriage work. We can't get divorced. Fortunately, he laughed. But, <laughs> but the fact is, there is a historic opportunity mm -hmm. for bringing some of that investment back from Asia, back from China in particular, to our friends and allies in in, um, in the Western Hemisphere. I think it's a historic I'm, opportunity. I'm curious, Ambassador Pinzon, the notion of a Team USA branding, how is the US messaging being received in Latin America right now? Um, how would it be received, a Team USA branding? Maybe that wouldn't go down very well. What, is, what are people hearing or seeing from your point of view from where you sit? When you think about what was the perception of China in the region, Gallup World Poll, 2010, 15%. By 2021, during the pandemic, 34%. Today, they're back to 23, 25. But it's clear that you know, they, they kind of raise their credibility into the region. When you think about the United States, it depends on the country. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go to Colombia, you kind of see higher numbers. But if you go to other countries, not so much. If you go to Argentina or so. Uh, so, you know, that's a challenge. But I will build on, on this very good idea that uh, General Richardson uh, is, is telling us today and, and, and what Central Corning is saying. Let me remind you, since 2013 to this year, Latin America, despite all this potential and all this opportunity and all the great things we can see, has been the slowest growing region in the world. And of course, that translates into crime, political instability, populism, attracting to authoritarianism, looking to other powers instead of a region. How do we change that? And I think the change of that needs to come certainly from rule of law, certainly to fighting corruption, but definitely expanding prosperity and economic opportunity. And I think uh, Central Corning is very clear. You know, we need this idea of French shoring, uh, near shoring. You want to call it as you want, that shoring, <laughs> but is necessary. It will be ideal if we can see more plants in Guatemala, Honduras, certainly in my Colombia, in, in, in Paraguay, in Argentina that are serving the whole supply chain of the world. If we can train more people, if we can expand human capital there, I think prosperity will start to spur. It's not a thing that will happen one day to another. It will take 10 years or 15, but that's where big plans and big ideas have always happened. And my final point is, I'll be you know, pushing the line, but I've seen uh, the US Congress making a wonderful set of approvals of incredible acts, you know, the CHIPS Act that actually benefits Arizona very much, or the Infrastructure Act that I see now the whole country getting some benefit of this. I always think that if we were to get only 5 to 10 percent, let's say 5 percent, of that money operated through American companies into Latin America, mm. but with a purpose of prosperity and national security, the impact will be huge. Imagine if instead of we getting ports from other powers of the world, we were getting ports done by the United States just because you want to make that port part of the supply chain, or roads, or schools, or hospitals. The impact of that will be huge. So I'm hopeful. I think, honestly, that because of culture, because of this relationship, the region can really, at the end, connect to the, to, to the US. But there's a plan that needs to be uh, done. And I hope that under that umbrella, that uh, General Richardson has described, we can put all these ideas. You're talking yeah. about a Marshall Plan, really, for Latin America, but, <laughs> but through yeah. American companies, because I don't think just giving right. money, given the corruption that already exists, is going to work. Um, I but, but I see what you're saying. Um, uh, I'm, I'm also curious, I know you have a point to follow up, but I'm curious about the role of disinformation right now in Latin America. What are you seeing? What are you seeing in terms of 
our team moving in, and, and what role is that having in terms of the uh, destabilizing governments or changing political landscape? Let me jump on this, and because I'm sure that General will be knowing really what's going on, but I'm telling you from what we saw in election time, in countries like Chile, in countries like Colombia, in countries like Ecuador, a lot of evidence of relations of social media actions from Venezuela and from Eastern European countries at a time. And let's face it, you know, the, of course we have challenges and we have these uh, issues of poverty that uh, the COVID ex expose, the inequality, the ineffectiveness of government, you know, all these challenges that we might have in the region. But the reality is that if you look to the numbers of poverty and social development in Latin America, the region has evolved very positively from 1990s to prior to the COVID. But that was very much exploited through this information and through campaigns that really impacted the political stability as we knew it, and now we have what we have. And we need to figure out what comes next onto that. I guess the question is, have you seen, I, I think that Russian television now has a very large uh, Spanish language service, why? Well, they, uh, I mean, there are Russian intelligence officers and Chinese intelligence officers all over uh, Latin America. Um, they view that as, a, as an opportunity, um, all, all sorts of opportunities. And sure, they're gonna use their, their propaganda, disinformation in order to disparage the United States and discourage um, these countries from embracing the United States. That's why we need to use our existing connection through the military to military relationship. There are soft power, uh, the economics opportunities that the United States through our private and private companies can, uh, uh, can provide. But we also need to remember that the experience of uh, many of these countries is very different. Even though, I mean, we were a colony of, of, uh, of England, they were colonized by Spain and Portugal for 300 years. Um, you look at the history of Mexico and um, most of the time for a long period of time in Mexico's history, uh, leaders of that country were, uh, were, the turnover occurred because of assassination and revolution. So our institutions tend to are a little more long lasting and more stable and that's part of what I think we need to do is try to work with our, our friends and allies in, the, uh, in, in, uh, in Latin America to try to help them because many of their institutions aren't as mature and capable of uh, withstanding the, the, sh the shocks that occur with some of the elections, some of the political figures that kind of come and go. And were you surprised to find that uh, in Mexico that a lot of their telecommunications were controlled by China, that 80%, I think, is the figure? I think or? Carlos, oh. Carlos Slim has uh, oh. very, very much uh, got a monopoly, I guess, in, in the telecom. But, well, uh, the general can, can speak to this too, but uh, that's another area where it comes to Huawei and, and Chinese oh. companies are uh, offering low or no cost um, mm -hmm. telephone backbone, uh, which can be used for uh, spying or just commercial data collection that, uh, um, that some of these countries may not uh, be able to otherwise afford. But that is another way that they are being so relentless in, in achieving their goals uh, and taking advantage of these countries that maybe don't have many options, particularly if the United States doesn't show up. General Richardson. Yeah, so 24 countries in the region uh, have 3G or 4G, Huawei or ZTE uh, technology, so PRC technology. And uh, working with one country, um, they're getting ready to put out their 5G tender uh, in June. And uh, the question is, you know, do you think that the PRC will offer a discount for the upgrade to 5G? Absolutely, almost, almost nothing. And you know, uh, 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 a leader of a country says, what am I supposed to tell them, General Richardson? What am I supposed to tell my people? I'm supposed to pay all this money when I, we're, have, we're hurting in our economy for another solution when I can just upgrade uh, for almost nothing? You know, what am I gonna tell them? And so, uh, you know, uh, when you talk about a communist government, who doesn't respect the rights of the, their own people? How are they gonna respect the rights of your people? 
uh, and having those backbones, you've got to have those hard conversations. There are other solutions out there, but we have to be uh, watching what's happening in this region and helping them. The, the problems that they're encountering uh, in terms of uh, this, this worst humanitarian crisis out of Venezuela with seven million uh, flowing out of this country, uh, all, of these, all of these countries, not just with their economies, but are dealing with the migration. I was just in Chile two weeks ago, with Argentina and Chile. Chile has a million Venezuelan migrants. Mm. They have a problem on their border with Peru. These militaries and their public security forces are trying to deal with these crises. They have food insecurity. They have droughts. They're trying to feed their people. You have the insecurity and instability of transnational criminal organizations. You have the human trafficking, the drug trafficking, the illegal mining, logging, fishing, all illegal. All of these things taking away from the revenues of these countries. And then the work that we do to try to help these militaries, all based in the human rights and rule of law, professionalization of the military. That's why our schooling is so much important, so much more important. Uh, new chief of defense for Brazil. My relationship with that person is so very important, as well as with the chairman of our joint chiefs. And with the two Iranian warships that came through the region and, uh, and did a port call in Rio, we both talked to uh, the chief of defense, but he's been to a military school in the United States. He speaks fluent English. You think that trust was already built when I called him up to talk to him about that hard topic, about why is Brazil um, honoring that port call in Rio? With those two Iranian warships that were just in the region with missiles and launchers two years before, we had that hard conversation, but you know that was easier to have with someone that you already have built trust with. So the exercises, Jennifer, you mentioned it before. I want to thank the senator because with the, uh, as I go around the region, I'm meeting with more senior folks, not just chiefs of defense and ministers of defense, in some cases presidents of countries and ministers of foreign affairs, because we don't have, uh, we don't have folks visiting the region. And I want to thank the senator. He brought a very large codel to the region to visit so many countries uh, with seven senators uh, was huge. But I've had a, 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 a leader tell me, what am I supposed to do, General Richardson? You know, uh, you talk about team democracy. I explain integrated deterrence. Admiral Aquilino talked about it in our national defense <laughs> strategy and Secretary Austin. I, I say integrated deterrence, bringing you know, the joint force, uh, allies and partners, academia, NGOs, everybody together, Department of State, our interagency, uh, and uh, I call it team democracy. So it, it, it resonates in the region. And the president that I was meeting with said, it doesn't look like there are a lot of people on your team, General Richardson. And I said, well, actually there are. Um, and we will work, and we are working every day to meet your requirements and meet your needs. And a little goes a long way in this region. They don't need big things. A little bit of money, a little bit of capability goes way further in this region. And so, um, and he told me, he said, well, you know, I've been told to go ahead and cut my deal with the Chinese now because the, the U.S. is like a Latin boyfriend. And the U.S. ambassador warned me that he might say this. <laughs> and I, and I just, uh, I, I just kind of looked down. And, um, and he said, you, you overpromise and you underdeliver. And I said, well, we're not. And we will do everything in our power to meet you where your needs are and to help you through all of your challenges. And we are here, and we're committed, and we're committed to democracies. And we're, admit, and we're committed to this region. Make no mistake. General Richardson, you're sounding a lot more like a diplomat than a general. You seem to have a lot on your plate, and I know from covering the Pentagon for 15 years that Southcom is always the least funded of all the right. COCOMs. Before we have to wrap up, I want to talk about the Panama Canal. How concerned are you that the Panama Canal, if the Chinese continue on the uh, path of uh, sort of gobbling up real estate, perhaps taking control of the canal, that you won't have access to that canal? And are you making preparations for that? And what do you think? We absolutely have to have access to the Panama Canal. When I say we, it's team democracy. It's the globe for the global economy. And, uh, and Panama, five, uh, in 2017, um, 
signed on to the, uh, the BRI, signed 47 bilateral agreements with the Chinese. They were celebrating their five year, uh, or the Chinese were, with Panama when I visited for my first visit last summer in June. They were actually uh, having uh, a, a celebration in the hotel that I was staying at, uh, the Chinese were. And, um, and quite honestly, we uh, had not had our senior diplomat in the seat for five years in Panama. We finally got uh, US Ambassador Mary Carmen Aponte confirmed and in the seat uh, the end of November of 22. Thank goodness. But this is, the, uh, this is how things are years in the making. They're not overnight. Uh, Chile, three years without an ambassador. Brazil, three years without an ambassador. Why don't we have our senior diplomats in the seat? Please, I need everybody's help to please make that a top priority. We have 50 ambassadors across the globe that are waiting to be confirmed. I need to get my ambassador in the seat for Colombia. This is part of Team Democracy. This is part of Team USA. When countries see that we don't have our senior diplomat there, it's, not, it's like not having a four-star general there. It's like having a three-star for General Richardson and Admiral Aquilino. It, it shows that we're not serious. That's the message that it sends. And then they, they, don't really, they don't really do anything of substance with the United States when we don't have our senior diplomat there. It shows disrespect. It shows disrespect. It is. Yeah. It is. I want to give Ambassador Pinzon the last word, perhaps, to explain what it is that uh, are we going to be looking back and saying who lost Colombia? Colombia is the the, the longest running uh, democracy in the region, great friend of the United States, closest friend. Um, but but is the U.S. doing enough to engage Colombia and to to keep Colombia as a great ally and friend? Hmm. What a question. <laughs> Three minutes. <laughs> All right. No, l l let me start with this. You know, when I think about Colombians, when I think about any other Latin American people, what they want is jobs, what they want is opportunity, and I want that to be very clear. You know, on any policy, on any strategy, we try to, you know, create for the region. I'm speaking from national governments to, of course, the importance of U.S. in the, the role of the U.S. in the, in the region. It needs to cross that idea and how to expand human capital and how to expand, of course, security, rule of law, and, and give that a stability. About Colombia, of course, uh, there's a lot of concern these days by many people uh, in, in our country, I guess internationally. <clears throat> Colombia became the closest ally of the United States in the Western Hemisphere uh, in a very strong effort for years. We actually were uh, declared by President Biden last year as a mayor non-NATO ally. So he kind of put us in the uh, maximum status you can ever have. I think, and, and I'm very happy to see General Richardson visiting Colombia because the military to military relationship continues to be the backbone of that relationship. Of course, the future agreement as well. And appears those elements are in place and are working and I will encourage that to happen as much as possible. But we cannot underestimate the intentions of who come to government with a populist agenda and start to erode institutions day by day. But let me move with an example. Unfortunately, bad cases and bad examples are happening in the region all across. Let's see the case of Nicaragua. In Nicaragua, we have a president that use the democratic system to get elected. But then he got reelected. But in what way? Seven of his competitors were in jail. So, you know, very easy to win an election like that. And then when he won, he decided next day to, to shift from Taiwan to China, which is what is happening very much in the region. There are only, I think, 10 countries in the world that are supporting Taiwan. Seven of those are in the Western Hemisphere. And only two are Latin, uh, is uh, Guatemala and Paraguay, nobody else. And I'm sure they're gonna swift, uh, shift in a, in, a, in a second. So that's the other thing. Let me go back to Nicaragua. So this guy changes for, for, for uh, China, keeps a counter narcotics base in, from Russia in his territory, and in addition to that, 
he expels like 200 people that oppose him with no consequence. That guy continues to have a free trade agreement with the United States. He continues to have every benefit that you, know, you can imagine. Some statements I've seen, but the reality is that those cases are there, not to forget about Venezuela, which are now getting an ease on the sanctions and somehow strengthening the regime. I'm just saying this because those examples are being watched by others. Worldwide, certainly in Latin America, certainly in my country. And they kind of say, all right, we can misbehave because misbehavior is not, doesn't have a consequence. That will be my reflection. Mm. Well, I want to thank my panel. I think what we take away from this is that Latin America is very important. China is moving in and trying to replace the United States. And they're also watching what happens mm -hmm. in Ukraine to see how the US and NATO behave, whether they stick with their allies, whether they stay the course, or whether they're you know, on to the next thing and, and turn their back on Ukraine. So thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you.